Hello everyone and welcome to session three of day three of the 2022 Mental Health Super Summit, an online conference co-hosted by Mental Health Academy and Act for Kids. And joining me for this session is Haley Purden. Haley, thanks for joining us, especially on a Sunday. How are you today? Yeah, doing good. Happy to be here. Awesome. It's good to have you here too. And I've heard good things about you from respectable sources. So um, now we're going to put you to the test, Haley. <laughs> yep, I apply no, the pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, for those of you that don't know Haley's work, let me give you a bit of a background on your presenter for this session. Haley has been an active advocate for people with a lived experience of suicide for the last 10 years. She has been engaged as a lived experience advisor across multiple organizations, including Lifeline, Black Dog Institute, and Roses in the Ocean, three very respected organizations in Australia, and has been engaged on many different projects, including the National Suicide Prevention Trials Evaluation Steering Committee. After becoming frustrated with the lack of critical reflection that the lived experience movement has engaged in, Haley started Critical, that's C-R-I-T-I-C, -I -I capital L, capital E, to promote better engagement of people with lived experience in suicide prevention through open dialogue. Haley holds an undergraduate degree in psychology, postgraduate qualifications in applied data analytics, aviation, human factors, and suicidology, so interesting, and is currently undertaking a PhD to uncover what engagement has looked like and what is needed to embed lived experience in suicide prevention at all levels, and I have personally spoken to her supervisor who commended her for her thesis defense halfway into the program. Haley, anything else you'd like to add? No, let's get straight into it. Wonderful. So for those of you that are attending your first webinar, just quickly our housekeeping rules. This session is being recorded and will be available a recording by the event portal after the presentation. So just check it out. The slides will also be available and in a few days, the session notes. And secondly, you cannot talk during this webinar, but you can submit questions, write comments and interact with other peers via the chat function. And at the end, we're going to do a QA and a with Haley. So we encourage you to stay in touch. Haley, time for your slides and time for me to disappear and be quiet. So I'll see you here in approximately 45 minutes for our Q&A. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks everyone for, for joining me here today. I'm here to talk about engaging with experience in suicide prevention. And what I'm going to talk about while it's specific to the suicide prevention context, it's still relevant for a lot of spaces where people with lived experience are engaged. I have lots of um, experience being engaged as a person with lived experience in suicide prevention, and I'm drawing on these experiences in the present presentation today. And um, as Pedro said, I'm also doing the PhD at the University of New England, and I'm drawing on the literature that I've been studying in the course of the, the studies. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connection to lands, waters and communities. I pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past and present. I'm on Ngunnawal country today and if you want to share the traditional names of the land that you're joining us from, just pop it in the chat. It's one small way that we can pay respect to the traditional owners who cared for the country we live and work on long before colonisation. I also acknowledge the tremendous value that lived experience brings to suicide prevention. And I wanna emphasize that the voice of lived experience is valid and essential for the work that we do together. The work in this presentation is built on the voices of lived experience, and it would not be possible without the courage and contribution of these voices. I'll be drawing on my own lived experience in this presentation and the experiences of others. And if anything challenging comes up for you emotionally, Put your self-care into action and get in touch with me afterwards if you want to have a debrief. So I come to you today representing Critical, which is an organisation founded to encourage thought leadership and partnerships across the suicide prevention sector between organisations, policymakers, researchers and those with a lived experience of suicide. There's been a really strong movement for the inclusion of lived experience. And with our progress so far, it's now time to take stock of where we are, where we've come from, in order to better understand what we need to be doing in the future. At the end of this presentation, I'll talk through a bit about what we do in this space. And after I get you excited about engaging lived experience, have a look at these activities and get in touch if you wanna collaborate on any of them. So to frame our discussion today, it's really important to tease out some of the definitions. 
in the suicide prevention sector, a lived experience is inconsistently defined. Usually, organisations define it as a personal experience of suicide, such as having directly experienced thoughts of suicide, made a suicide attempt, cared for a loved one who's suicidal, or lost a loved one to suicide. And the last one is often referred to as being bereaved by suicide. But lately, there's been some who have asked the question, what about people who have experienced suicide in their job or have a lived experience that's not covered by these narrow and specific definitions? Well, some organisations like Suicide Prevention Australia, they add on to the definition touched by suicide in any way. And this has been a bit contentious, particularly, particularly with those who are bereaved by suicide as they feel that absolutely nothing can come close to understanding suicide without having that profound personal suicide loss. So who gets to decide what a lived experience is? Well, at the moment, it's organisations. Your organisation might have defined lived experience or maybe they haven't. If you look at lived experience job opportunities or key documents, you might see that organisations specify their own definition or maybe they refer to well-known ones like the definition by Roses in the Ocean or the recent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander definition that's published by the Black Dog Institute. But who do you think should decide? Do you think that organisations should set the definition and those with lived experience should either fit into it or not? Uh, research has attempted to capture what people with lived experience think about these definitions and what the research says is that definitions are really important to people. There's been an interest in research that seeks to understand a suicide exposure continuum as it relates to bereavement and a continuum approach might go a little way to capturing the people like frontline workers and health professionals who are exposed to suicide and experience really profound impacts. It also attempts to capture those who lose people to suicide who are further out on the social closeness scale and also describes why some people experience long-term and really profound grief while others are able to return to some level of normal a bit quicker following a suicide loss. Some people that we speak to say that definitions are really narrow and constricting and they're really not necessary for the work that we do. So at Critical, we give the power back to the people who identify themselves as having a lived experience. We believe that it's up to the individual to define and describe their lived experience in the way that they choose, and it's their right to say whether or not it constitutes a lived experience. So let's jump straight to the voice of lived experience. Roma says, I'm not a great fan of binaries. They tend to perpetuate denial and oversimplify reality. There are clinicians with lived and living experiences of suicide. They are, not, they are one of us and also one of them. How do clinicians engage with their own, let alone others? The answer symbolizes the nature and extent of the problematic culture. <clears throat> So when I fill in a form that asks me which lived experience bucket I fit into and they don't allow multiple choices, it's really hard for me to just pick one. And this is really common. Having a previous lived experience of suicide is a risk factor for suicide. So it makes sense that once you start collecting, it's really hard to stop. For me, having survived a suicide attempt was my induction into the world of suicide. And next up, I found myself supporting my partner who also attempted suicide. So I went from attempt survivor to carer and now the two experiences are really integral to what I know about suicide. This is the intersectionality of experiences. How do these individual and narrow definitions intersect and change the way a person with lived experience uses their voice? We really need to start having this discussion. Next up in Roma's quote is the way identities are formed. In the push for lived experience engagement, we've created an us and them dichotomy. But the truth is, we're so much more than just our lived experience. When we overdefine our experiences, we make them our identities. And I found that in the sector, people are increasingly being called lived experience people. Now, by doing this, we make 
the sole contribution of people with lived experience, their lived experience, when in the truth is there's so much more than just the story of their brush with suicide. And this moves into the next issue and perhaps an alternative one that we need to have a sector discussion about. Recently, I was talking to a leader in a mental health organisation about how to increase the number of people with lived experience in leadership roles that are not designated lived experience roles. And they said, well, I have a lived experience and I'm in a leadership role, but they're yet to publicly disclose that lived experience and openly draw on it in their work. Now, I'm sure you know many people who are in the same position. Like lots of us come to this work because we have lived experience, but we get roles that don't specifically require us to draw on our experience. So back to Roma's quote, how do we enable clinicians to connect with their lived experience and bring it into their work? Well, this is complex and probably comes back to dominant and unsaid cultures about, well, I am the expert and I can't show vulnerability in my work, but we really need to be talking about this in practice. So this leads on to how lived experience knowledge fits within mental health and suicide prevention contexts. Let's talk about knowledge. As a practice related field, organizations rely heavily on knowledge generated from their own activities. These activities are often informed by research. For example, the lifespan model that the Commonwealth government chose to implement has been empirically demonstrated as a success in other countries. So there we have two forms of knowledge. Then the third is the lived perspective. And in my time in suicide prevention, I've seen this form of knowledge move from being a source of storytelling and awareness raising to being relied on as a valid form of knowledge for practice. In this shift, we haven't really asked what exactly can experience tell us about suicide. And in academia in particular, often this knowledge is still seen as just anecdotal evidence. And this is where John's quote comes in. Only when lived experience, clinicians and researchers walk side by side as equals will we reduce the suicide rate. We all have a piece of the answer. When we all work together collaboratively and respectfully, then the magic will happen. Lived experience is not a box to be ticked, but a vital part of the answer. So how do we bring these voices in? On the screen, you'll see a collection of terms that people with lived experience use to describe their activities in suicide prevention, and also the job titles that organisations publish for people with lived experience. Now, it's not an exhaustive list by any means, but the thing to draw out here are words like facilitator, advisor, supporter, worker, representative. What we see less of currently, but are on their increase, are roles like lead and coordinator. But these labels don't tell us much about what engagement means, and the truth is it's fully understood. In my experience and the experience of our partners at Critical, some of the engagements are in the form of advisory committees, peer support workers in the boardroom, as peer work coordinators, running community events, speaking at community events, as researchers or research participants, and running community action groups. So what structures these engagements? There are well-known models that have been used for many years across lots of different sectors, such as the one here on the screen, which is Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation. These models are generally presented on a spectrum that describes arrangements of information and power sharing. Their language suggests that it's less desirable at the information sharing only end and more desirable at the full citizen control end. But the way our services are set up, they rarely allow for full citizen power. The way our organisations are structured means that the ultimate decision making ability is really far up the line and away from places where lived experience is engaged. Also, some cultures within our organisations work actively to discourage the sharing of lived experience, either intentionally or unintentionally. The slippery co-slope. I wonder how many of you here today or listening later will have been involved with 
or at least hear someone say one or even all of these co-processes on the screen. Have we gone a little bit too far? From where I see it, funders love a good marketing spin. Hey, it makes their politicians look good. And how good does it sound when we say we are co-doing our work with the people? But what it means in practice, it's so variable. I was recently on a co-evaluation working group and there was a distinction made between academics and lived experience co-researchers. So if we unpack this a little, you wonder why the lived experience co-researchers were not simply called academics with lived experience or the academics also called co-researchers. So we have to be really careful in the co-branding that we aren't just hiding uneven power structures. When we co-do anything, we need to be asking who leads the process, who is responsible for the decision making, who generates the material. And often I see that the co-process is just a simply a consultation that's been rebranded. Recently, I've come across this resource by the Community Mental Health Drug and Alcohol Research Network. It was written by researchers with a lived experience and it outlines in a practical and easy to understand way some of the considerations in these co-processes. It's specific to a research context, but it can be applied across other areas like program design. In the document, the definitions are clearly stated and examples are given to really highlight their meaning. It highlights the parts of the project that partnership is needed to really co-produce material. So we need to be in partnership at the planning and then design phase, in implementation and in reflecting on our processes. You can't just plan something, set parameters, and then bring in people with lived experience to co-design based on those parameters and then send them on their way. And at the same time, honor the spirit of true co-processes. So I encourage you to look up this resource. It's a great read and it's really helpful in putting lived experience engagement into practice. So we inconsistently define lived experience, co-doing, and much of what we do in the engagement of lived experience space, but it's really important to get specific. Our friends at Melbourne University published a review that they did on the evidence for peer support programs, and their findings highlighted that there were varying definitions of the peer support concept and what peer support means in practice. And the ultimate statement being that this inconsistency means that we have no idea how things work or even if they work in peer work. And this is the same for other types of engagement with lived experience. We really need to be clear about what we are doing, why it's important and what we learn from it. Doing this is the only way that we're going to grow in our approach and achieve best practice. So now I've talked about the mess that is how we describe engagement. So why should we bother and even attempt to unpack this in our own work? Well, the level that motivates you could be that it's a human rights need or it benefits us all, or even this one here, that the government demands it and as the ones with all the money, we listen to them. Over the last five years, the National Suicide Prevention Advisors Task Force was activated and funded a lot of research into lived experience engagement and how we do suicide prevention better in Australia. And this was one of the recommendations that came out of all of that work. All governments commit to integrate lived experience knowledge into national priority setting, planning, design, delivery and evaluation of suicide prevention services and programs. Now, this recommendation and the other ones were supported by the government and given mostly to the National Suicide Prevention Office and the National Mental Health Commission to achieve. You've also probably noticed that in your funding application, sometimes you're asked whether or not you've engaged in, with lived experience in your project. So engagement isn't something that's nice to have and aspire to. It's more and more commonly expected in service design and delivery. So we might want to listen to and work with voices of lived experience, but what do they get out of it? We know from research that telling your lived experience story is really good for you. It helps to make sense of a difficult experience as you 
step through what happened and that leads to better coping. You know yourselves, when you talk to people around you about hard times that you're going through, it's so good, it feels so good to express yourself, be noticed, validated and heard. I used to do a lot of presentations where I'd share my lived experience story and after these presentations, I was guaranteed to have someone come up to me and say, thank you so much, I recognise a lot of that in myself and now I know that I'm not alone. I'd also have people come up and say, what you describe sounds like what I see in someone else. Tell me how I should respond to them. See, what happens when we tell our lived experience stories is that we voice something that people rarely get the opportunity to talk about and people want to be part of it. It also helps us have conversations about how we respond better to suicide and raise awareness on topics that are not often discussed. See, early on in my lived experience work, a wonderful man, John Bradley, said to our group, I want us to stop using the word commit when talking about suicide. For him, the word commit was associated with criminal behaviour and he loved his daughter so much and it just broke his heart to think that her death by suicide was associated with a criminal act. For me, I didn't even give a second thought to the word commit and I would have used it because everyone else was using it, but knowing that he felt pain every time the word was used changed my approach. Without talking to lived experience, we won't know how to do better, and people with lived experience really want us to do better. I'm really passionate about social justice approaches and dismantling systems that perpetuate disadvantage and uneven power. And when I came across this paper, I wasn't surprised, but I wanted everyone else to read it. So from Curtin University, this research looked at suicide prevention documents that were supposed to be helpful for people to support those who were suicidal. I emphasise that these documents are supposed to help, but they portrayed people who are suicidal as dangerous, different, lacking in coping skills and burdensome. I really doubt that these resources were written or even checked over by people with lived experience. So if the resources are right, then those characteristics should be my own, but I hope I've demonstrated to you in the last 20 minutes that they're far from who I am. I love pictures like the one on the screen. It's such a good summary of why we should listen to lived experience. See, marketing has got it right for so long. They say, how do we tailor our services to meet the customer's needs and therefore sell more products? Whereas in health provision, we have the approach of how do we provide services for the most amount of people for the cheapest budget? And then this demands that our customer fit into that mold. So we're not gonna prevent suicide if we require people who are suicidal to adapt themselves into the help that we're offering. So by listening to lived experience, you get the information to make the service better fit the person who needs it. It also helps you to build greater understanding of the realities of lived experience, much like what I spoke about with the storytelling. By understanding, you increase your capacity for compassion and just become a better human, really. When you include lived perspectives, you have your effective program design and this results in better services. So let's stop expecting people to fit what we think are the best services and actually ask them what the best services look like for them. People with lived experience have a long history of being really poorly treated by the systems and people who work within them. So I urge you to consider your plans to engage people with lived experience and ask yourself who they serve. As an advocate, I've been asked to tell my story for so many different reasons, but one of the main ones is to motivate funders. And this just goes beyond testimonials that show how good your services are. And it's more about using lived experience stories to motivate others for your own commercial gain. One of my friends in this space was invited to tell their story to one of those shock magazines, you know, the ones that have headlines like, my mum came at me with an axe or tricked into marrying a cult leader at five. And my friend had never heard of this particular magazine and so gave their story willingly and in good faith. 
only to have it sensationalized and angled to shock and sell the magazine. And it was a deeply traumatic experience for them. Also beware of coercive participation. This serves one party only again. People with lived experience are so motivated to use their experience for good that it can be easy to take advantage of that goodwill. So make sure the relationship is reciprocal. Give due acknowledgement to the people that you work with. Some people may be unwilling to be identified publicly as participating in your work, but ask the question and negotiate a fair acknowledgement. And the last one is one that cuts across all of these considerations and comes back to the stories that sell. Why do you use lived experience? Is it for social media likes, for example? Now, if you're on some social media platforms, you might see stories go around where people post a photo of themselves, upset, crying, and then they tell a lived experience story. And these go viral because people view them. But what's the value in peering in the display glass to look at the messiness of someone else's life? What do you actually achieve from these viral posts? Are you just putting these stories on show or are you leaving it open to engage with them somehow? See, lived experience engagement is most meaningful when it's a two-way street. So into the practical ways to avoid the pitfalls I've spoken about and to do things the right way. Firstly, plan, plan, plan. I hope you realize now how important it is to really get to the specifics in your engagement. Really think about and write down why you want to engage in the first place. And it isn't enough to say that you want to engage because everyone else is doing it or because it's required of you in your funding arrangements. You need to get specific about your stakeholders. Just about anyone can have lived experience, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their experience is applicable to your context. What types of lived experience perspectives do you want? Are you looking for people who have used a particular service? Maybe they've got a specific life experience, like being a parent, or maybe your project would even benefit from the specific um, suicide experience, like an attempt survivor or people who are bereaved. See, although the sector talks about lived experience like it's a homogenous group, we really aren't. There's so much diversity. Once you know who you need, you need to work out what you will expect them to be doing. Are you embedding them in your team as in employees or wanting their advice and input every few weeks? Also, prepare for what you'll do when you start to increase your engagement with people with lived experience. Do you have the capacity within your organisation to adapt to the advice given? Do you also have the capacity to properly support the engagement? In one of the advisory roles that I have as a group, myself and others were asked to comment on a plan for the conduct of some research. Now the research team had already designed the work and we were asked whether or not it was a good idea, more or less. So we provided frank, frank feedback about the design and said a few things needed to be changed and rethought of, but then the research team said that there was no scope to change the things that we raised. So it wasn't clear exactly what they wanted our advice on and it made the advice that we gave absolutely useless. It's unfair to expect a person with lived experience to contribute to the success of your organisation and not be paid appropriately for it. It's important to ask your organisation if they have the resources required to appropriately compensate someone for the work that they do. It's also important to have key personnel whose job it is to manage the engagement. If you're working with people with lived experience outside of an employee-employer relationship, you really need someone to coordinate the engagement. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we don't know a great deal about how engagement with lived experience in service delivery works because of various reasons, but among them is the lack of formal evaluation. So if you plan to do it at the start, it becomes a lot easier to formally assess what you've done and how it worked or didn't work. Once you've thought about the why, who and how, it's important to put some time into planning the policy and structures that you need to pull it off. If you're employing people, of course they need contracts and terms of employment. If it's a more casual arrangement, you still need those things, but they may take the form of things like a terms of reference. These keep everyone on the same page when it comes to the details of the engagement and they'll be a valued 
reference document for when things inevitably slide off the rail a bit. Now, when it comes to payment, you might choose to put payment into the terms of engagement, but if not, you really need a paid participation statement or policy. You can have a look at how other organisations do it, like the Black Dog Institute and the National Mental Health Commission. They both have their policies public. If you're new to engaging with people with lived experience, the chances are that you and your team might need some training. And there's lots of organisations that have training available and a good place to start is training in trauma-informed practice. You're likely to have a training calendar for your own organisation too, so why not open up these opportunities to the people you're engaging? See, any training will only benefit the value that they bring to your organisation. A really key structure that you need is support from executives. And I don't mean that, yeah, they think it's a good idea, but they're actively invested in and understand the value of lived experience engagement. So invite them to participate in your meetings, create direct channels between your lived experience team and the executive, and keep the engagement on the agenda for those high level meetings. Now on the topic of meetings, you need to set out how these are structured. Working with a prominent organisation in the suicide prevention space, for our meetings, there's a how-to guide that the coordinator developed. So when teams in the organisation come to the group to get advice, they follow the same presentation structure and they're allocated a consistent amount of time to talk about their issues. So there are no surprises when it comes to meeting structure and it allows us all to make every meeting effective and keep on track. When a team does engage the advisory, they keep the group in the loop for how the project progresses and this keeps everyone on the same page. And as I said earlier, it's really important to communicate clearly what you expect from the lived experience people you're engaging. On the topic of support, many organisations provide access to an employee assistance program, but as many lived experience roles are informal, people in these roles rarely have access to this kind of support. So you need to decide what forms of support you will offer the people with lived experience that you engage. Also, many people with lived experience that you want to work with have other employment or duties that they attend to. So this might mean that you need to adjust your expected turnaround time for work or allow flexibility in when work is done. Accessibility is a really key consideration and you need to build in the systems and structure that allow it. And finally, there's no need to over or risk manage people with lived experience who you engage in your work. In the words of Sam, there is no need for clinical speak or risk assessments. Let's show kindness and compassion to each other and be prepared to have courageous conversations. Now, I find it really odd that when we employ people who then experience mental health issues or suicidality, we treat them as employees first and foremost, and then we support them appropriately. But when we engage people who declare their lived experience up front, we wrap frameworks and principles of engagement around them, and we forget that they're simply people and employees first. We should be assuming that everyone has a lived experience and just treat them with respect and compassion rather than othering people who publicly state having a lived experience. So now you've done all the groundwork and that's probably the hardest part. It's time to run with it and put it into practice. And here you should be onboarding your new lived experience representatives appropriately. Give them the insider knowledge about how your organisation works and how they fit into it and make them feel welcome and supported in their new work with you. Keep regular and open communication. We've long seen the distant lived experience advisory group that sits off to the side and works only with one or two people in an organisation. And that's not very inclusive. Make them part of the team. Invite them to organisational meetings, social gatherings, and build up the relationships between your lived experience representatives and other members of the team. If you want an engaged and motivated lived experience team, you need to bring them into the fold. Now let's mention again accessibility. You need to be sensitive to how the people you engage prefer to work and keep an eye on how accessible your work is and make sure that you're flexible to the needs of the people that you're engaging with. A valued group in the lived perspective is that of carers and the nature of this experience might mean that they have to 
disengage from time to time due to their responsibilities. So allow for this to happen and don't penalise people for missing meetings and deadlines. Now, you're probably thinking, how can I keep my lived experience representatives well? But you should also probably ask, how can I keep myself well? It isn't just important in the lived experience space, but all spaces where we work, that we need to be prioritising our own well-being. In a session that Critical hosted recently about peer work, one of our attendees spoke about the challenges of working in a peer role when someone expresses that they're currently attempting suicide. They spoke about getting support from other peers in the space and sharing their experience with another person who really gets it. Now, in clinical practice, this is branded as supervision, but it's essentially peer work. You're problem solving with another person who knows what you're going through. So if we're open to these conversations at work, we can better support each other. In the words of Ursula, for meaningful engagement of lived experience, you've got to allow and accept emotions in the people sharing their lived experience. It's not something that should be sanitised to boardroom style discussions. People giving of their lived experience have the capacity to manage and accept their emotions. When someone expresses thoughts of suicide, we go into panic mode. When someone says they aren't coping, we go into panic mode. But these are really common experiences that many of us have day to day. So instead of hitting the panic button, why not have a conversation? Emotion is natural and completely normal, and we need to make space in our work to allow for the expression of it. Otherwise, we continue the stigma that having emotions is bad. Now, knowledge sharing and knowledge generation and sharing is so important for us at Critical because there's just so little of it out there. And if you aren't talking to people about what they know, you can't access the knowledge, knowledge that you need for your own practice. So if you did your planning properly, you will have built into evaluation into your engagement. If you're well connected, you might engage someone else to evaluate your work. Um, like one, one organisation I work with, they have a partnership with a university and they periodically come in and run focus groups about the lived experience group and how effectively effective or ineffective it is. These can result in journal publications, but you might not have the, that capacity and that's completely okay. Your approach might just be to think and brainstorm internally about how you're going. And you could share this with other organisations so that they might learn from what you know. At one of the organisations who engages me on lived experience advisory panel, in partnership with our coordinator, we have developed a presentation to deliver internally and externally on the way that things are done at the organisation and how they are a success. And by presenting this to another organisation, they changed their approach and implemented a paid participation policy when previously their advisors were volunteers. They understood from our presentation that payment was really important in valuing the contribution of people with lived experience. And so they changed their practice. In your planning, implementation and evaluation, have a look at how things are being done in the sector. This paper from Sarah, Kathy, and Miff was commissioned for the National Suicide Prevention Advisors Task Force work that I spoke about earlier. And it's a really good paper and provides a background for how things are happening at the moment. The participants in the study spoke about mostly being engaged for storytelling and doing this repeatedly over time was pretty exhausting. The research also highlighted the need for trauma-informed practice when engaging people with lived experience and the need for ongoing support during and after engagement. The paper also suggests some training needs that we can, so that we can get better at engaging with lived experience. And it echoes a lot of what I've spoken about already. And it's a good place to start when you're thinking about how to increase your particip the participation in your work. Other resources. There's so much out there that bigger organisations publish about how they do engagement in their organisation. These are often put out by government bodies with the resources available to do the extensive policy work. So if you're strapped for time, just adapt one of them into your own practice. They can be specific like the peer workforce guidelines or the second one listed on there 
on lived experience in the lifespan trials, which is a really good paper, by the way. Many of the points they include, though, can be translated into the work that you do. And these are just a handful that's out there. There's so many more. The last one on the list I just want to draw your attention to. If you're in a service delivery organisation, this might be a really simple and useful place to start. This document is just a list of higher level principles and considerations that you need when you're planning and delivering your lived experience engagement projects. Uh, all of these resources are publicly available on the internet. And if you need further guidance, talk to people. Unless you've got some unicorn of an innovative idea, the chances are that someone else is doing it or has done it before. So come and have a chat with me and I can probably connect you with someone who can mentor you through the process. So in summary, in engaging with lived experience, I want everyone to go through these five processes and no shortcuts. Plan, plan, plan. Don't do it on the fly. It won't be done well. You need to invest in putting effort up front and it will minimise the headaches that you get down the track. And I promise you that. Develop your structures and systems that enable your approach to be a success. These are things that you will use to keep you on track and make sure things, that are, done, things are done well. And as you implement your plan, make sure you're keeping communication open and learning as you go. Be flexible in the implementation as things might not go according to your well-designed plan. Think critically about how you're progressing and evaluate. Devote an hour a week or more to really thinking about what's happened and how you might learn from it. And publish what you share. Publish what you find, sorry. Publish or share what you find. Let's start a whole sector conversation about engaging with lived experience so we can do better in the future and speed up progress. Things are moving way too slowly and we're making the same mistakes over and over again. And the only way to change that is to start a really frank conversation. So before I finish up, I just wanna circle back around to Critical who I'm representing today. At Critical, we're all about having these conversations and connecting up practitioners, organisations, policymakers, researchers, whoever, with people with lived experience. There are a number of things that we do that you might benefit from if you're thinking about engaging people with lived experience. So Professional is a series, a monthly series of Q&A style discussions with a person with lived experience who uses it in a specific role. We've hosted two so far, one on using your lived experience at conferences and the other on doing peer work. And our next one is coming up next week and is about lived experience in the boardroom. And these chats are not just useful for people with lived experience to get a feel for what's possible, but also for practitioners who engage people with lived experience in these ways. We share how things are done in these roles and how we might do things differently. They're free and recordings are posted on our YouTube channel. I also write a thought leadership blog based on my observations in the sector. I invite others to comment or pen their own critical thought pieces. And if you're interested in publishing something in the blog, get in touch with me. We also offer consultancies and links to other advisories who, other advisors who might be better suited to your consultancy needs. And um, as I've mentioned before, I'm doing the PhD and I'll be disseminating the findings and reflections through Critical as they emerge. And the Critical Network will be a base from which I start my fieldwork next year. So if you're interested in contributing to the research, get in touch with me. And Critical also has a large network of people with lived experience in many different roles. And so chat with us again if you need access to people with lived experience. I said get in touch a lot on that last slide and I really mean it. You can jump on the website, have a look at what we do, send me an email at the contact email address or use the QR code here and it'll just add me to your phone contacts with all of the, the links to the website and the social media. We've got a newsletter you can sign up to, Facebook and LinkedIn pages where you can get updates from the work that we do as well. And thanks so much for your time today and I'm happy now to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Haley. That was great. I'm going to leave this on the screen for a few more seconds, but questions sent through the questions. I'm going to start with the question submitted by Denise a bit later, 
bit earlier. Um, the question is: any comments on any comments on how you can offer on the service that can be provided to CAT teams to CAT teams who are financially employee and time overstretched? Um, is the question in the? Can I see it? Yes, it's in the Q and A. So, any comments on what you can offer in on your service uh, to CAT teams who are financially employee and time overstretched? Um, that's that's a problem that a lot of um, organizations teams face: the lack of resources and the lack of time. But if you want to do lived experience engagement, you really need to make it a priority and pull resources and funding from other areas. Um, you know, it's just the reality that we live in. But, um, you know, if you want to do it well, you have to have that investment in it. So that's really the only advice um, that I can give for that one there. No problems. And for those who want to submit your questions as well, don't forget to drop them, drop them in the chat uh, and we can pick them up and ask. Haley, another question. Um, for those that are just watch this presentation and uh, want to get involved in, you know, advocacy or integration of lived experience into their work, uh, whether it's from an individual or more systemic level, what would you recommend as the sort of first step if they haven't engaged with this at all yet? Um, would you recommend, you know, joining an organization, signing up for something or taking some sort of training or learning program or talking to someone? What, what would be the most impactful sort of first steps you would recommend to a therapist? Um, well, the first step would be to talk to somebody uh, who's doing it, um, you know, learning from what other people have done in this space uh, is it's what this engagement piece is all about. And in doing that, you can kind of learn the, the other steps, like you said, joining an organisation, doing some training. Um, you can kind of learn from other people what they have done and what's worked or not worked. Um, but also there are lots of organisations out there. Um, Roses in the Ocean is a really great one who provide services that um, and training that boost the ability for people to engage with lived experience. So, um, yeah, talking to someone and just, you know, do a search, lived experience engagement. There's so much out there on the internet from, like, document resources to organisations. Um, you just need to start to to dig through that kind of thing and also get in touch with me i'm happy to chat about that sort of thing as well really i've dropped a link to rose in the ocean here in the chat i'm also dropping a link to brian edwards mha expert profile she is the ceo of roses in the ocean she's done quite a few presentations in previous summits around this topic so take a look there and explore um, Haley, do you want to uh, tell more about what it was like when you first started working in this field um, and compared to how it is now and how you see the next big leap into in development or the big, next big thing that's going to happen that's going to open up more opportunities? Um, when I first got engaged, it was really scary. Um, the, there just wasn't opportunities in the suicide prevention space for people with lived experience. Um, and I didn't particularly connect with the mental health consumer movement because a lot of my um, suicidality wasn't connected to a mental health issue. And and so, um, yeah, the, the work that we were doing in that first advisory group was was really um, groundbreaking and, and frightening, but the vibe, I suppose, of the group was so connected and safe and supportive, so... Even though we were doing something new and scary, we were we all had each other's back, and and that was really great. Um, these days, the, the community of people with lived experience who are getting involved is massive, and it's still a really safe and supportive space, um, and that's really exciting because you know instead of just a small family of five people, we're now a mass of hundreds, and it is like family relationships, you know. We, um, everyone is so supportive and connected in, in their work. Um, to your question about the future, well, that's why I started this PhD because I don't know where we're going. We've got, um, you know, organisations like Roses in the Ocean who are stepping forward with, um, 
you know, their approach for how they see things into the future. But, um, you know, they're driven by organisational strategic aims when what I really think we should be doing is asking lived experience and the huge diversity of lived experience where we should be going to next. And so that's why the PhD. Um, so I don't have an answer to that yet, but in three years, I'll have an answer to that. Thank you very much. Next question is from Ge Gregory. And the question is, how do we destigmatize and educate politicians and the public about suicide and suicide prevention? Um, the breaking down of stigma, it's not my area of expertise and uh, the research that's out there, um, you know, there's not really much of it and it doesn't, it doesn't really show how we do it effectively. But I would say that it, I'd be um, pretty confident that lots of politicians and people in the public have a lived experience. Um, Greg Hunt, who was our previous Minister for Health before the changeover in government, had a lived experience and was open to sharing his lived experience. So instead of destigmatizing and educating politicians, I think the, um, the approach that we really need to be taking is how do we make a safe space for people to be able to be honest with and open about sharing their lived experience? Um, one of my friends, Graham Holdsworth, did some analysis about the uh, board member biographies of different mental health and suicide prevention organisations. And he looked at 80 biographies and only one had acknowledged a lived experience in their biography. And it's not to say that there's not people in board member roles who um, don't uh, that who have a lived experience it's just they're not being um, disclosing them in such a public way so I think yeah how we kind of change that is we need to start the conversation about how we how we enable our leaders to kind of come out of the closet so to speak about their lived experience thanks Haley. I think everybody can agree that integrating the lived experience into any suicide prevention efforts is is key. Um, how, what are your opinion on, um, so in my experience, and I think that, that the experience has been uh, shared by many people that I've spoken with, sometimes what, what happens is people are so focused on putting the lived experience center in the middle that they, um, there is a certain judgment towards anybody that doesn't have a lived experience, uh, academics that may be studying suicide prevention because they didn't directly have a lived experience themselves and they don't know what, what they're talking about and they should totally ignore what they're saying. Um, obviously, that's you know a very extreme side of the pendulum. Um, but um, in your in your opinion, uh, through your experience and your conversations with people, what are the best ways to sort of uh, reach a middle ground and educate people so that you can actually integrate both and see the validity of both perspectives and not just have one extreme end or the other? Hmm. Well, first up, um, I want to say the lived experience movement doesn't want academics to feel like they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, they do know what they're talking about. They've put a lot of time and effort into studying and uncovering truths about um, suicide in, in a systematic way. and. So it's not about whose opinion matters more than the other. It's more about how we work in partnership and um, kind of share the power uh, rather than one person or one group being having more power or knowledge than the other. Um, and uh, on, um, oh, I've forgotten my train of thought now. Um, yeah, okay, it's gone. Hopefully it'll come back. Um, and I'll jump in with it later. Denise is asking, how does your PhD work have might have to do, what does your PhD work? I'm just re rephrasing here because it's probably written very quickly on the phone. Um, so how, do, how does your PhD work or what does your PhD work do uh, in relation to current organizations being after a suicide incident assistance offering instead of finding more preventative aspects of suicide. So I guess she's asking whether your PhD is more focused on the prevention side of things, on the post prevention side of things. Um, neither, um, Denise. It's about uh, how lived experience is engaged in 
uh, any um, aspect of suicide prevention. I'm not interested in any interventions themselves, but the behind the scenes work of how the live perspective uh, can influence or um, contribute to effective suicide prevention uh, designs. So, um, yeah, not at the crisis support intervention side of the piece, um, but behind the scenes where no one's really talking about the hows and, and the whats of, of how people are engaged in suicide prevention. Thank you so much. Haley. I'm going to ask you a question now that I've asked all of the presenters in the summit so far. And the question is, drum rolls, uh, it's not a trick question. Um, what what was or what were, could be a plural, could be a single resource, uh, a book or an article or a podcast or a conversation that you had that kind of uh, professionally, from a professional perspective, changed the way you thought about something or you know, opened up a new path in your career that it was kind of an aha moment? Was there anything that uh, you could comment on or share? Um, well, joining my first advisory, I wouldn't be in the mental health suicide prevention space if not for joining my first advisory committee um, as a person with lived experience. Um, that's completely changed. Which committee was that? Sorry? Which committee was that? Uh, it was at Suicide Prevention Australia all the way back in 2012. Um, it was just an advertisement that I saw. I think it might have been in an email. It was before social media was used as an engagement tool so it must have been in the newsletter of some sort and it was just a call out saying hey do you have a lived experience this is what a lived experience is we'd love to get your input on the policy and strategic direction of suicide prevention australia the peak body for suicide prevention organizations and um i hadn't really connected um what i'd been through or labeled it as i have a lived experience of suicide um i had experienced that I wanted to die and I didn't want to be here anymore. Um, and seeing that, I was like, hey, I have a lived experience and um, like it sucked what I went through and I don't want other people to, to go through what I went through. And so, yeah, if I hadn't have joined that first advisory, um, like I've been interested in mental health, but I don't think I would have gone on this path of being um, an advisor, a lived experience advisor, and um, you know, doing a PhD on lived experience engagement. So that first step of just joining an advisory, putting myself out there was was the thing, I suppose, that changed everything for me. Thanks for sharing there, Haley. Now, before we wrap up the session, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to say some final words. There could be anything from here's what you guys should do next to, you know, Here's a recommendation, join my newsletter or anything else you'd like to say, share a motivational quote or anything that moves your spirit. Um, okay, motivational quote. Um, people with lived experience are people too. Uh, we don't need to be scared of engaging with people with lived experience because we're people that you'd be engaging anyway, talking to in the community, it just might not be, you know, pinned on us. Hey, I have a lived experience. So don't be scared of engaging with lived experience. Um, we're, we're really nice people. <laughs> For a wonderful way to finish the session. Thank you, everybody who attended the session. We'll be back here in approximately one hour for our next session on MICBT, Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. All right, Haley, have a great Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to contacting you sometime soon. Thanks, everyone.